Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this evening for this event. I'm Emma Norris. I'm the Deputy Director at the Institute for Government. I'm delighted to welcome John Edwards, the UK Information Commissioner, to the Institute this evening. John is the UK's sixth Information Commissioner. He began his role in January this year, and before that he served as New Zealand's Privacy Commissioner for eight years, from 2014 to 2021. Um, and in a previous career as a barrister, he was advising government on the freedom of information. Now, tonight we're going to range across a pretty wide range of subjects. Um, as the UK's independent data protection watchdog, the ICO is right at the heart of discussions on data use and how to find that balance between privacy and transparency. So we're going to be discussing the ICO's new strategy, what steps can be taken to improve government transparency on data, government's use of WhatsApp and private email, whether it's time to reassess the UK's freedom of information laws and how they work, and what, if anything, is the ongoing impact of the pandemic on government's relationship with our data. So we're going to kick off um, with some conversation between uh, me and John. John will make some opening comments, we'll have a bit of conversation between us, and then I'll come to the audience for questions, the audience in person and online. If you're here in person, then you know, just wait for a mic, um, they will be coming around. If you're online uh, watching the event, you can start submitting questions via Slido um, straight away, so please do that. If you need a code, it is IFG and ICO. We'll also be live tweeting the event, and the hashtag will be IFG and ICO. So I think that's me done with housekeeping and introducing the event. So John, I'm going to come to you uh, directly for some opening remarks on your strategic priorities as Information Commissioner, the kind of challenges that you think the ICO faces and the new strategic plan. Thanks, Emma. Thanks, everyone, for coming along. Um, I recognise that this is an audience mostly comprised of people with an interest in public sector and data protection. So my comments are more oriented and, and freedom of information. My comments are more oriented to that audience, despite the fact that um, uh, the remit of the ICO covers the entire economy. Uh, so we can spread ourselves pretty thin. Uh, and that fact underpins, I think, probably the most central point of the ICO 25 strategic direction, which is how we uh, allocate our scarce resources to have greatest impact uh, for the greatest number. <clears throat> Economies and democracies uh, rely on trust, the digital economy even more so. If people don't trust digital platforms, uh, they won't use them, and the efficiencies that they promise will not be realised. The maintenance of trust requires confidence in a strong regulatory framework. People have to know that someone is watching, uh, that someone has got their back. Government is expecting more and more from the public service and is banking on efficiencies being delivered by the provision of services digitally uh, and by the smart use of data holdings. If government cannot generate and maintain social licence for innovations around the digital delivery of services and the innovative use of data, those projects will not succeed. The organisation I lead, the ICO, has a central role to play in giving citizens the confidence that their personal information is safe and will be used appropriately. It's incumbent on me to articulate a coherent and comprehensive regulatory strategy, setting out how I intend to play that role. You may have heard earlier in the year that I started thinking about our enforcement approach to the public sector. There was a specific case that prompted these reflections, and I want to tell you about it. In February, um, we issued a reprimand to an NHS trust uh, for breaches of the UK GDPR. When that case first came to my desk, it came with a recommendation of a significant fine. And that prompted me to ask a few questions about how these services are funded and how fines are paid. Um, being a newcomer to this country, um, it was important that I um, make those inquiries. It was immediately obvious to me that levying a fine on this organisation would take funding out of the pool available for the direct provision of services to those communities. And in fact, that would mean re-victimising the very people who had been the subject of the breach. That really didn't make any sense to me. In central government, a fine creates a money go-round. We take it from the left hand and deliver it to the right, moving money from a department to the treasury and then back into the consolidated account. 
again, it just didn't make any sense to me as a deterrent uh, or as a punishment. There's very little evidence that fines on their own produce improved outcomes for the people we are here to protect. There's even less that it is an effective way of improving data practices in public authorities. <clears throat> My job is to focus the efforts of the ICO where they can have the greatest impact. Very often, this means the not flashy, but more effective working alongside organisations to enable and encourage their compliance, to help them to achieve their objectives in ways which comply with the law, rather than coming along after a breach and punishing them. When we do come to enforce, we need to avail ourselves of the full range of regulatory tools that Parliament has provided in the legislation we administer. This doesn't mean that fines won't have a place in our regulatory approach to public authorities. Because the legislation provides for fining, it's not open to me to simply take that off the table. That would be to defy the will of Parliament. But what we will do is reserve fines for the most egregious breaches that cause or have the potential to cause the most harm to people. And I've got uh, one or two in mind that you'll be seeing soon. We did in fact find after we uh, implemented this policy, um, the Tavistock uh, Health Trust um, in relation to breaches which uh, put people's lives and well-being in danger. Some commentators seem to believe that fines are the only way to achieve compliance with the law. Anything else, such as a reprimand, reprimand is a surplus, is going easy on them, is letting them off with a slap on the wrist with a wet bus ticket and nothing more. It's not true. It's, it's a falsity. Reprimands are enforcement. They're right there, second in the list in Article 58.2 of the UK GDPR. First is the power for the Commissioner to issue warnings, second to issue reprimands. Enforcement actions occur across a spectrum, a toolbox of graduated responses to non-compliance. At one end, there are organisations who genuinely want to do better, <clears throat> but they don't know or understand how. This is where our guidance, webinars, events and training resources come into play. In the toolbox, these are the gloves and safety goggles. They provide help and support to those who need it. At the other end, there are organisations who willfully and deliberately choose to be non-compliant. They know the law, yet flout it for profit or to get ahead of competitors. For these bad actors, a significant fine may be the only appropriate response. They get the hammer from the toolbox. But what about those who fall in between? That's where reprimands, warnings, enforcement notices, orders and limitations come in. They're the screwdriver or the wrench or the drill, allowing time and space for us to work with them on what needs fixing or to adjust and change behaviours without inflicting damage on their customers. A recent example of this was a reprimand we issued to the Department for Education. Under our old rules, the non-compliance with data protection law could have resulted in a £10 million fine. However, our investigation involved working closely with DfE to educate them and improve their practices so the breach couldn't happen again. When we concluded our investigation, we were satisfied that the DfE had taken all of the steps we recommended to improve outcomes for everyone. An enforcement notice would have simply told the DfE to do what they'd already done. So for me, it was fine to stop at that reprimand level. A reprimand draws public opprobrium and provides, in my view, sufficient accountability. This leads to our second change. This cooperation with DfE shows how this approach to working with organisations is an effective way of achieving compliance with the law. But this only works if there is a level of accountability. That's why I asked government to set up a senior level cross Whitehall working group to raise the bar on how public authorities use and handle personal information, to share information. This openness and transparency is vital to improving compliance with the law across the public sector. This compliance approach applies to freedom of information and environmental information laws as well. The caseload is stretched to breaking point across the whole of the public sector. And we're not exempt from that as the regulator as well. One of the problems we identified when we looked under the hood was 
our response times in appeal cases. We understand that at the end of every FOI case is a person trying to exercise their rights. We understand also that our approach to FOI complaints has to change. The present system means cases are taking a long time to complete, which ultimately hinders the delivery of effective transparency and open government. We're committed to improving our own performance, and we know that there's no silver bullet to do this, but we're making changes where we can. And so to the third and final change that I wanted to highlight this evening, we're consulting on a proposal to prioritise and fast track some complaints and appeals in FOI where there is a clear public interest in the information in question. What we're saying in effect is we cannot administer this law effectively in the way it was intended by its drafters. How do we mitigate against that? How do we give effect to it where it matters most? We've got, I said, as I said, a range of responses to our performance in this area, but one mitigation is to give us the power to prioritise matters. And we're consulting on some criteria for that, and I'd be very interested in hearing your views if you could access that consultation document on our website. So that's a brief overview of uh, some of the thinking we've been doing in relation to our stance uh, with the public sector in the first 11 months of my office, uh, and I'd be happy to discuss those or any other ideas that you had, Emma, or from the, uh, from the audience. I think we're using the Slido, aren't we? So we are. in fairness to everyone, um, if, this, if you could use the Slido uh, to upvote questions, uh, put your own questions in there, um, that just is a, is a very democratic way of allocating the public resource, which is commissioner's Q&A time. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you, John. And thanks. Really interesting detail on some of the changes that you're planning to make in the ICO. I want to come back to um, your points on enforcement and transparency shortly. But before we get into the detail, I just want to take a, a step back. As you say, you've, you've been in post for 11 months for just under a year, and it's been a really <coughs> unusual year. So, so kind of during and post pandemic, which contained all sorts of changes in the relationship between government and citizens on data. Um, Lots of political instability, scandals around the use of private email and WhatsApp, delays to data legislation. I know that one of the first things you did when you came into the role was to undertake a listening tour. You wanted to listen to what others thought and felt, um, what their worries and concerns were on use of information. Tell us about some of the, what were the main things you, you heard? What were people telling you as you were undertaking that tour in, in this very kind of difficult period? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, I wanted to understand the relationship that businesses, uh, civil society, local authorities and government had with the legislation we administer uh, and with the ICO. What I found was in some ways a little bit surprising. Um, I think uh, most business organisations that we spoke to um, had a plea for continuity. Continuity uh, in the approach to the law and continuity of the support that the ICO was providing them. I heard a great deal of um, appreciation for the way in which the office engages uh, with uh, industry and with um, civil society uh, and for the kinds of products that we create to make compliance easy. So that was really heartening. Um, I was also interested in the quite overwhelming support for the uh, maintenance of uh, the UK's adequacy with the EU, uh, and as I say, with the desire to not upset the apple cart with radical reform that would require retooling of systems that had, um, had a lot of investment uh, and that were now considered settled. Thank you. And you know, you came over having spent many years um, as the Privacy Commissioner in New Zealand. Do you think there's anything that the UK can learn from New Zealand's approach to kind of data and information, or indeed any differences between the UK and New Zealand that you found kind of particularly surprising? Um, the main differences are of scale. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, well, there, there are a bunch of differences. I mean, we're quite closely culturally aligned, I think. New Zealand is often regarded as a laboratory for reform. Um, it is a unicameral House of Parliament, which means uh, any government which has a minority can
can affect legislative change, uh, and there's less sort of need for the kinds of negotiations across factions or between houses uh, and the like. Um, I mean, interestingly, New Zealand has been through a law reform process that has taken it a little closer to the UK GDPR, mm -hmm. but still falls short in a number of respects, and still has maintained an adequacy determination from the EU, which means that the European Commission regards New Zealand as a safe place for European data, despite the fact that we had, had no power to issue large fines, we had no power to object to automated processing, uh, a number of differences like that. And so I think that probably gives some comfort to reformers who want to um, create a law here that more closely reflects the cultural and legal traditions of this country mm -hmm. uh, and carves a new direction from the um, European uh, GDPR approach. Okay, thank you. I also wanted to ask about your kind of personal approach to the role. You've talked about the importance of openness and, and transparency. You know, what can we expect from you as, a, as commissioner? Are you going to have a big public profile? You know, how are you planning to use um, you know, forms like Twitter, for instance? Um, I do think that communications is really important. You know, you ask, going, going back to uh, what we learned in the listening tour, some of the feedback was that you know, we talk a lot, we, we provide a lot of materials for a lot of people, for a lot of organisations, but we do it on our terms. Mm -hmm. We use our language, and more and more we need to meet people where they are. Um, I, you know, after we changed our approach to um, public sector fining, and, uh, we, and we um, decided that we would be making greater use of some of the other enforcement tools, mm -hmm. Um, I had a meeting just a few weeks ago, um, and my enforcement team uh, said, we've issued 30 reprimands. And I, I said, well, that's great news, but what are they? And why aren't we telling the wider world? So we'll be making those announcements. I mean, my approach has always been that as a regulator, when you go around with your whack-a-mole, mm -hmm. uh, you might affect behavior of one organization, right? Uh, but unless, and, and that's quite an investment. The investigation, the punitive action, whatever it is, it's quite an, an investment. It takes a team of people, uh, it takes lawyers, uh, it takes a long time, it disrupts the target organisation. Uh, and in order for that investment to, um, to, to produce a yield, you've got to actually take those lessons and tell those stories out in the world. I mean, my philosophy is we do it, we spend, we invest once at the centre, whether that's on guidance or widgets, you know, tools on our website, or whether it's in investiga investigations and enforcement action, and then we tell that story many times. Mm -hmm. We do it once at the centre, it's used many times out in the economy. So yes, we will be um, issuing uh, lists of those reprimands so people can look and say, oh, when you do this, this is what happens, we better not do that. Right? Or here's an enforcement notice in which this organisation was found not to have patched its servers, not to have trained its staff, not to have conducted a privacy impact assessment of a new sharing, and here is the consequence. We better do those things. Mm -hmm. And in doing that, we can change outcomes. And, you know, it's, it, it's, it's really hard for regulators, but it's important. I, you know, we could go onto a league table of fines and say one authority uh, issued 10 times more fines in number or in volume, that tells you nothing about uh, the outcomes for people in that community. Can I tell you one story um, from health and safety? Uh, I attended a presentation at our international conference recently which talked about this outcomes-based regulation. And there was a... A, a series of graphs which showed um, comparative regulatory interventions in health and safety. I think it was the metric was number of inspections undertaken. Germany, Italy, France, the UK. The UK undertook one quarter 
of the inspections that had happened in Germany, one third that had happened in France. I am now slightly making up figures, but um, <laughs> it's, it's one or the other country. But you'll get the point when I get to the punchline. The second slide was a line graph showing um, the number of fatalities from workplace accidents per thousand. And the UK was far better in terms of the outcomes than those more interventionist mm. regulatory economies. Mm -hmm. So that's telling us something I think that's really quite important. Um, there's not a direct correlation between uh, the use of those very uh, interventionist regulatory tools and improved outcomes. Yeah, really interesting, and particularly your point around kind of communication and transparency in and of itself being a kind of a compliance mechanism, um, essentially. And so let's, you talked, um, you've come back to enforcement, and I'd like to talk a bit more about some of the points you made in your speech. So, you know, you're going to, you're changing the way that you, you deal with fines, are planning to cut down in some ways on their use in the public sector. I mean, do you think there is any danger that some organisations, perhaps some bad actors, if you like, will take compliance less seriously without the threat of fines? And, and I suppose, you know, you've outlined the concept of a, of a spectrum, an organisation that wants to comply but perhaps doesn't know how to, down to an organisation that is, is willfully kind of breaching um, what is allowed. Is it always easy to tell where an organisation is on that spectrum? Um, I think that... I think that that is reasonably apparent, actually. Once we, once we engage with them, uh, it's, it's usually pretty apparent whether they are trying to conceal stuff from us, whether they're trying to get away with something. I mean, in the, in the public sector, the, you know, the, you know, there are a number of different accountability mechanisms, right? Um, there are questions in the house. There are the, the ballot. Uh, and where there is a lack of oversight and a lack of uh, effective um, discharge of these obligations, the, 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 the sanction of publicly calling it out, mm -hmm. I think is far more powerful uh, than, the, um, than the, 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 you know, the writing of a cheque that comes from an account that doesn't affect your own salary, you know, doesn't affect your own day-to-day -day business, doesn't affect shareholders. There's no accountability. Mm -hmm. And you also talked about transparency, and in particular that enforcement only works if there's a level of accountability um, that accompanies it. So you're setting up a senior kind of cross-Whitehall working group to raise the bar on how public authorities handle personal information. I mean, can you tell us a bit more about that, and in particular how you think that body will increase kind of openness and transparency? One of the things um, that I think our website still says, actually, is that, um, in general, uh, we won't publish reprimands. We're, we're reversing that. Mm -hmm. That will be the default position. We will publish. Um, but a cross-Whitehall group uh, will allow us to share, through that network, uh, all the information about the experiences of their peers. Mm -hmm. So rather than us playing whack-a-mole okay. and going around finding the same problems in department after department uh, after investigations, we go through that group, we say, here is what we found in this organisation. Do you have the same vulnerabilities? Because here's an opportunity to get ahead of it. And if we have an, a, senior, a sufficiently senior engagement, uh, I think that um, they will seize on that opportunity, they will empower their data protection officers and they will resource the uh, remedial steps that are necessary to uh, avoid the risks. I mean, what we're talking about here is, you know, very often, um, it, th these are not just theoretical issues of non-compliance. These are things which can put people's lives at risk, uh, and we've seen a number of those. And so they need to sit up and take notice. Um, when you send a an email with a whole lot of sensitive information in it, uh, sorry, with a whole lot of um, email addresses of, of recipients in the, in the CC field and not the BCC field, mm -hmm. and you thereby expose those people to each other as recipients of this sensitive information, uh, you can put people's lives at risk. And when you do it two or three or four times, you can expect a pretty significant um, response. You have to learn from these things. That's what that Whitehall group is about. It's about saying, sharing the information about um, 
what kind of conduct leads to what kind of consequences. And I don't think we at the ICO have been sufficiently open and transparent about that. Mm -hmm. The more we can be, the more certainty we deliver into the economy. The more lines we draw, the more stakes we drive into the ground. I also want, talking of sensitive information in government, um, want to talk a little bit about the use of WhatsApp and private email in government. Um, some of you might have seen that we published a report on the use of WhatsApp in government. Do have a look at it if you haven't read it yet. Um, our analysis showed that between 13 and 31% of officials in some departments have WhatsApp installed on their work phones. They're using it on work phones. I mean, what, what are your views on recent revelations about the use of personal email and, and WhatsApp in government? And you know, does it undermine accountability and transparency in official kind of communications? Well, we've um, published our own report uh, on this as well mm -hmm. earlier in the year um, as a result of inquiries. Um, uh, arising from um, matters in the pandemic and, and leaks and the like. Our report was called Behind the Screens, and it also, like yours, highlighted the increasing use of non-official channels. Now, I think, really, that is the reality of, of modern life, of modern communication, and I think your report highlighted that uh, government hasn't moved fast enough to take advantage to provide yeah. secure channels that are convenient to people, so people are reaching for the off-the-shelf ones that they can have on their own phones, right? That of itself, I don't think, is objectionable. Uh, but if people are using those kinds of tools, they are expected to do a proper security um, assessment of them. They're expected to know what level of um, of, uh, of information can be shared on them. They're expected to keep it safe. Uh, they are expected to keep a public record so that it doesn't just exist in that app, that if, if it is work matters, um, that an official record is maintained. And that, frankly, is just common sense because it, it reduces the administrative burden. If they are asked to comb through six months worth of WhatsApp messages next March, mm -hmm. It takes a heck of a lot longer than it does just to ensure that they are making sure uh, relevant official information is documented uh, as it's generated. Thank you. I'm going to come up to audience questions, seeing somewhere where we've already used up over half the time. Um, but I want to ask um, a question first on, on the pandemic and kind of learning from the pandemic. Now, during the pandemic, the government's relationship with, you know, with our data um, changed dramatically and I think citizens accepted you know in some cases supported much greater kind of government insight into their lives than normal um, test and trace location data for instance do you think that citizens expectations about use of their data have kind of permanently changed as a result of of what happened during the pandemic and and do you think government's attitude to data has changed this is one of the things that I think um, commentariat find it difficult to grasp. There's nuance in, our, in people's relationship with data. Mm -hmm. All of these decisions and attitudes are entirely contextual. Uh, so while you know, there was an acceptance that we are facing together this national crisis, which requires new responses uh, that may not have been tested in time, we come together and we allow it for that purpose. That does not mean we don't care about our data. Because at the same time as you see that, you see um, uh, ob objections being raised to things like care.data, right? Uh, and the GP um, equivalent. So uh, there is a, a kind of reductionist attitude that, oh, you put everything on, on Facebook, or look at, what's, you know, look at what Google knows about you. How can you? How can you care about what the government does with your data? Well, we can, and, you know, and we are entitled to. And we are entitled to make decisions about different uses in different contexts. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, what the COVID example tells us is that if you have good communication, if people understand the nature of the transaction that they are being asked to agree to, uh, then m most people will, uh, will go along with that, provided uh, they're given assurances of the kinds of safeguards and provided there are independent regulators like the ICO to sort of patrol the boundaries. We actually have a report coming out on data sharing in the pandemic which says 
something very similar, so uh, that's good news. Um, I'm going to open this up to questions uh, from the audience now. I'll start in the room um, and then come to Slido. I'm going to take questions in threes. Um, can you please wait for a mic? There should be a mic coming around somewhere. And um, can you please say your name and what organisation you're from? So who would like to ask a question? OK, one here. Uh, yes, Nigel Fletcher from King's College London. Um, I should also say that I'm on the um, Advisory Council on National Records and Archives, so you can see where I'm coming from. Um, I just wondered, in terms of the FOI regime, um, there is obviously this uh, delicate balance between um, the need for um, confidentiality and um, candour within government uh, and the public interest in um, disclosure of, of um, national records. Um, both historic records and also um, contemporary records. I just wondered um, if you have any thoughts um, on that balance and whether the, um, the current FOI regime um, gets that right, if there's anything that you think needs to be addressed. Thank you. Martin Rosenbaum. You mentioned the Cross Whitehall Working Group and how it's helping to share lessons on the use of personal information. Have you yet got the government to sign up to FOI also being covered by a Cross Whitehall Working Group? Uh, if not, when do you hope that might happen? If so, it's already happening. Can you please tell us something about the lessons that are being communicated via that process if it's happening already? Thank you. Hi, I'm Gavin Freegard, Institute for Government and elsewhere. Um, one of the big things sort of coming in data world at some point is the data protection and digital information bill. And when the consultation on that was first published, the ICO was quite robust in responding to some of the changes that were being proposed um, to the Commission and particularly the Secretary of State's power over it. How do you feel about the bill as it's currently drafted? How are you... How, and how will the ICO sort of respond to some of the things in there about its new role? How are you planning to adapt to that? Brilliant. Thank you very much. Okay, so we've got um, two questions on FOI, balance between confidentiality and candour and um, its involvement or otherwise in the Cross Whitehall Working Group, and then the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill. Yeah, thank you. Well, to Nigel's point, um, uh, I, I mean, I do hear that ministers and public servants regard as really important the need to be able to give uh, fully candid uh, and unvarnished advice uh, without fear that that will go straight out and end up on the front page of the Telegraph or, or whatever it is. Uh, and that if FOI is applied, that reduces that confidence and that's going to reduce um, the uh, robustness of advice that that is given. So we at the ICO are constantly uh, testing those assumptions uh, and constantly um, finding that balance in particular cases. And of course, um, there there will be times where the public interest in revealing uh, a certain item of information is so compelling that it, it outweighs that protection. And I think that you know, to a degree, public servants exist in that world already. They know that uh, there may be some inquiry or some leak or some mechanism by which uh, advice that they feel professionally bound to give may find its way into the public. Uh, but they, uh, like you and users of the FOI, need to have confidence that an independent, a fiercely independent regulator is there making those uh, judgment calls, having heard from both sides about the relative importance of maintaining that confidence versus uh, getting a bit of public ventilation uh, of the background to a decision that's been made on an issue. It's hard to speak more specifically than that when we're talking in, in the abstract, but, um, uh, but certainly that, that's, that's our daily business and it's something that I take very, very seriously. Thank you. Uh, to Martin, to your point, um, I think it, th there is potential to establish a um, network of FOI practitioners for the same rationale, to learn the lessons uh, and to share that information to get the multiplier effect on, a, on, on something that um, we learn in one uh, investigation um, dispersed across the other. 
Um, but to your question, we haven't established anything yet, so there's, um, there's nothing to report back on that. But I think it's an idea that's worth pursuing, and I'll be discussing it with officials. Gavin asked how I feel about the Data Protection uh, and Digital Information Bill. And um, I was pleased that we were able to get that legislation to a position that I was able to publicly support it, uh, and I still do. Um, I think that it strikes an appropriate balance on, on the particular point you raise uh, about the role of Secretary of State. Um, uh, th there is a role, you know, privacy commissioners, information commissioners, data protection authorities uh, sometimes have rulemaking powers. Uh, these are under the auspices of a parliamentary enactment. Um, and I think it is appropriate that there is a mechanism for um, the executive and the parliament to assert some oversight over those. Um, and I, I'm quite comfortable with the idea that um, uh, I will submit uh, very, what, you know, what, what amounts to delegated legislation uh, to a Secretary of State prior to issuing it. And that if he or she um, disagrees with it, that they will um, make a comment that is also transparent and publicly available. So that, so that the, um, uh, the, the positions are very transparent and those who are making decisions are accountable. But, you know, I have had a conversation with um, people in Europe about uh, whether that, you know, the impact that that has on the independence of the ICO. And my position is this. Guidance puts a gloss on the general principles that have been laid down by Parliament, right? It gets a bit more specific. It says, here is how the ICO is going to enforce this law. So if we do that, and Secretary of State says, no, I'm not signing that off, that does not change the way I enforce that law. And there is no ability for Secretary of State to interfere with or to influence how we apply the law in a given investigation. So I, I hope that um, that clarifies that I think the, the, the particular mechanism that you, know, you raise doesn't materially change the independence of the ICO at all. Okay, John, using your um, democratic approach to Slido, I'm going to pick some of the top rated questions. Um, so first up is, is data protection a helpful concept or should we think about data rights instead? Um, I think you've previously made some comments to the DCMS Select Committee, which were interpreted at least by some people as, as suggesting you might be open to charging for some FOI requests. So can you say a little bit more about that? You know, are you open to, to charging for FOI requests? And then um, finally, um, interestingly, do you think we'll ever get to a point when enforcement action is taken against public services which do not use data, for instance, refuse to share it or don't use it to appropriately target their services? Thank you. So first, um, data protection versus data rights. I don't, I mean, I think this is, it's, it's fairly semantic, really. Um, you know, privacy is a human right. Uh, we had members of the... Um, European Parliament out here talking about uh, data protection being fundamental human rights. I'm perfectly comfortable with that. I think that that's absolutely true. Um, they, they're, they're just different descriptors for the same thing. This, this bundle of protections for things that we, uh, for information that we, uh, that we are entitled to assert some autonomy uh, and control over. Um, so yeah, they are data rights, the data protection. Um, maybe the questioner should elaborate a little more because I don't really okay, If see you're listening, questioner, then you're welcome to send in a follow-up and I will ask it. The point about charging for FOI um, was a, a, a comment that I made uh, in the confirmation hearing at Westminster. Um, and, you know, that, that, that's a policy question. There's no provision to charge for freedom of information matters at the moment. So uh, I made the comment... Um, based on my experience in New Zealand, where there is an ability to recover 
uh, some of the administrative cost of dealing with um, uh, what we call the official information uh, matters. And those can act as a, um, that, that can impose some discipline on requesters who are disproportionately burdening organisations by seeking um, very wide uh, category swathes of, of, um, of documents. Uh, I'm not advocating for that to come in here. Uh, I don't believe there's any law reform proposal um, uh, requiring that. I simply made that observation at the time. Uh, and enforcement, what was the enforcement? So you, do you ever see us getting to a place where organisations are fined for not using Oh yes, data that's a really interesting question. I mean, I don't, I don't want to say, never say never. I mean, I do find it frustrating sometimes that um, uh, in the, particularly in the kind of safeguarding world uh, where you have organisations that hold information about children who are at risk mm -hmm. uh, and they don't share it and something terrible happens and they say we didn't because of data protection. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just negligent um, and shouldn't be tolerated and should be followed up and, and, and addressed with training. Whether our data protection regime um, is the right mechanism for driving, you know, for, for correcting those kinds of behaviours, it's difficult to say. Uh, I mean, we are going to be looking into this, I think, at the office, because it's an area that um, is really important to me, that, um, that when people look at data protection, uh, they don't see it as an excuse for not sharing information appropriately. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Okay, we're going to take a few more questions in the room. Got one at the back here. Um, thank you very much. Um, um, what I wanted to talk about is you started it off by speaking about how um, issues had been magnified at the time of COVID and how similar the issues are across the board. I'd like to look at it from another point of view, an intersectional point of view. And for that, I draw from the experience of Paul O'Neill, who um, turned um, over safety at Alcoa. It's a very good book to read. And in doing that, he had to understand where the problem was coming from. It's obviously a societal, cultural problem if it's across many of the sectors. And what I found in public service is that they generally serve the underserved. And many of those people do not have no idea of freedom of information, subject access, and perhaps their data is not as treated as well as perhaps other educated people like us. So, a suggestion. Perhaps this, um, these changes you're making should go more at a much more local level, perhaps in schools, you know, et cetera. So people understand that the rights that they have. And if they do understand the rights that they have, as they go through the system, they will be able to know what is right and that affect the cultures of where they work. That's just a suggestion. And the biography of Paul O'Neill on Alcoa is very interesting to read because many of the points I did translate in my work when I was working in compliance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions in the room? Yep. Just can I just respond to that just very briefly? Can, um, because I think that the point that you make is one that is reflected in our strategic plan, ICO 25, which, um, uh, which challenges us to identify communities of unmet need. Uh, who are we serving? Who are we not seeing? And in not seeing, are we denying rights? Um, where are those communities? It's very easy to provide information rights services to people who already know about them uh, and who are resourced enough to engage with the kind of legal process. Uh, and that's not a small barrier to overcome. Uh, so I do think that we have work to do to ensure that uh, these rights are accessible by everybody in society, uh, not just those who um, have the resources uh, to draft a complaint and to engage in a lengthy uh, and intensive process of uh, legal process. So thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, Matthew Gill, uh, Institute for Government. Um, the consultation last year um, revealed that government wants all sorts of things from data and from uh, data sharing. And so um, th th there's an expectation on you both to protect people, but also to facilitate the realisation of all sorts of opportunities for the UK, I mean, ultimately for, for, for economic growth, I suppose, through data. Um, and I wonder in practice if you could say a little bit how, about how you trade off your protection role and your role in, in promoting good, good use of data and, and whether that affects your approach to enforcement cases. Thank you. Um, well, I'll, I'll say I don't. I don't see it as a trade off. It's not a zero sum game. I'm not in the business of saying, um, let's chuck out these rights so that we can get these innovations. I'm in the business of saying, what are the legitimate activities? What are, the, what, are, what are you trying to achieve, government, with this proposal? How can we help you to get there in ways which preserve privacy, uh, which preserve those uh, data rights? Um, it's not a question of saying, um, and I even actually controversially reject the language of balance. You know. What is the balance between innovation and data protection? Why would we have to balance them? Why can't we have both? You know, I, I've heard many times you can have privacy or security. You can have both. Um, and it's about ensuring that uses of data are proportionate, are safe, are transparent, um, and that people are informed and empowered um, to, to uh, exercise some autonomy. So, yeah, I mean, I, I do kind of reject that premise. There, there, there are allocative decisions that need to be made, uh, and when I apply the resources of the ICO to help the government achieve an objective, uh, I am there trading off on spending that same resource on an assertive enforcement action against some digital industry. I recognise that, but you know, we are obliged by statute to, uh, to cover the entire economy. So those trade-offs are part of our everyday life. And what's important to me is not that we are, um, uh, that, not that we are making those and we're prioritising some things over others, but that we are open and transparent about those. Thank you. A couple more questions um, coming in from online. So the ICA recently issued the first FOI enforcement notice for seven years against the Department for International Trade, requiring it to respond to all overdue FOI requests. Do you think that we're going to see more of these kinds of notices against public authorities with big backlogs of FOI requests? And then um, the listener has got back to us on data protection versus data rights. Does protection send the message, albeit inadvertently, that data should be locked away rather than something that's actively used and sometimes shared? Um, and does that affect our wider cultural attitude to data use? Um, so to the first point, are we going to, sorry, what was it? Are we going to issue more enforcement notices in FOI? Yeah, for departments, still public yeah. authorities that I think back it, up. Sure. Um, yeah, well, we will, is the answer. Uh, I mean, we, I think, issued a, a a, um, a statement before my time, but recognising the strains that um, the pandemic had placed. You know, it's really actually difficult to meet your statutory timeframes when staff can't go into the building. Uh, what I've more recently started to say is that the pandemic is an explanation, but it is time limited. Mm -hmm. We've got to have recovery plans uh, and commitments to getting back to um, a, a BAU explanation. I don't believe that the language of protection uh, creates an expectation that data is not used. Um, it should, data should be protected in transit, at rest, in innovation, in research, but it doesn't prevent any of those things. Mm -hmm. Fantastic, thank you. I've also got a question about um, the online safety bill. I mean, this has been a controversial piece of legislation um, in, in the UK. Um, it was in its report stage before summer recess. It hasn't been brought back to the Commons yet. What are the implications for the bill for the ICO? Um, the bill creates um, 
a legislative regime which butts right up against our own, mm -hmm. uh, and a parallel um, enforcement uh, agency uh, in the in Ofcom. So, so, so we will both be regulating the same industries, sometimes over the same activities. Uh, and what that means for us is that we need to be working very closely with Ofcom to ensure that uh, we send consistent messages to those industries uh, and that we apply our respective mandates in consistent ways. Uh, and we do that through uh, an entity that we established last year called the Digital Regulators Cooperation Forum. Mm -hmm. We do that through strong bilateral uh, uh, arrangements with Opcom, which we're, we, we've launched with a, a joint meeting of our teams, not just at sea level, but right, you know, vertically integrating so that the investigations teams are talking to each other. Uh, at a policy level, uh, we have or are about to issue a joint statement on our approach, our, our regulatory approach. So, um, you know, there will be times when there'll be a matter which could come under either jurisdiction. You know, there was the terrible tragedy of the, um, the, the Molly Russell death, which has been examined by the coroner recently. And the coroner heard traumatising evidence of the kind of content that um, that young woman was exposed to, which drove her to despair. And the content under the Online Safety Bill is something that would fall under the jurisdiction uh, of Ofcom. Mm -hmm. The way in which she was fed that content by the use of her personal data, by the, you know, the, the algorithm processing her preferences and pushing more and more extreme stuff towards her, that is something uh, that is of uh, concern to the Information Commissioner. So you can see how it would be really important in those kinds of cases uh, for us to be working in lockstep, and we will be. Thank you very much. OK, I'm going to ask one um, last question uh, from the online audience, uh, more on legislation. So with the changes we expect on GDPR with the new bill, will there be support for all organisations who might need to change um, their data practices? Already, small businesses have a data protection officer, but often gives them no training. So you know, how are organisations going to be supported to equip themselves for this new regime? Uh, well, again, that... Um you know, we, we will be investing heavily in providing that support. Um, each of those small organisations pays a, a registration fee uh, to the ICO, and that's how we're funded. Uh, and we owe them a duty uh, to, to reduce the burden of that transitional change and of ongoing compliance as much as we can. And traditionally, we do that by producing guidance, uh, and we will continue to do that but I think that we need to be thinking more creatively about the kinds of tools. Um, I think a small business that's just trying to get on with making its widgets um, and wants to know the minimum it has to do to stay out of trouble um, doesn't necessarily want to read a 60-page guidance document. So more and more we're producing tools fit for those kinds of organisations. We've got um, uh, an eye advice, we've got a small to medium enterprise hub, we've got... Um, Helplines, which are, you know, I've never heard anyone say a bad word about. They, 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 they are praised from Scotland to Cornwall. Fantastic. Okay, we're at half past, so I think I'm going to have to um, draw this to a close. Um, before I do, uh, I need to highlight uh, the next um, IFG event um, that we uh, have, which is tomorrow morning um, on the Autumn Statement. So do join us for that or via the website or in person if you can. Um, look, John, thank you so much uh, for joining us tonight. Fascinating, really frank discussion about your priorities for the role, some of the changes you're making and some of the kind of bigger issues on data and information that we're facing as a society. Um, thank you to all of you for joining us, both in person um, and online. And I believe we've got some drinks outside, so um, do join us for a glass of wine. Thank you very much. Thank you.